Now, tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us, for a couple of reasons, very fortunate to have Murray Paulson with us. He is a member of the Edmonton uh, Center of the RASC, and he is an eclipse chaser. Uh, he has been to many, many eclipses, one quite recently. And what he's going to do is just show you what's, a, um, what's available to be seen uh, for an eclipse. And the reason why we're uh, having him now is because uh, roughly this time, actually April, April the 8th next year, there is going to be a total eclipse that will uh, march across the, the U.S. Uh, starting in Mexico and heading diagonally up uh, sort of to the northeast across uh, the U.S. and finally exiting over Newfoundland. So it's actually going to... Uh, reach Canada. Uh, so uh, now is the time, uh, if it's not too late, now is the time to kind of book your vacation and uh, a Mazatlan or something like that for next uh, next year, April the 8th, and then you can tune in to see the eclipse. But what we'd like is uh, for, for Mary just to show uh, some of his experiences, what some of the things that he's done and his uh, career as an eclipse chaser. So, uh, Murray, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it, this is uh, an honor to come out and uh, visit you. Uh, it'd be much more fun to do it in person, but yeah, maybe next year. Uh, eclipses are, are a blast, and... Uh, Anybody that knows me or has been at any of my talks knows that I'm enthusiastic and I absolutely love going to them. And eclipses is, is a two-time giving uh, proposition. One, you get to see a, a beautiful event. An eclipse is just incredible. And number two, you get to go someplace new that you've never been before. And uh, this is great because it's taken me to many places in the world that I never would have thought I would ever go. And uh, that's, that's I think, the wonder and the miracle of an eclipse. Yep. Uh, I uh, did stumble here. I, I forgot the exact date of when this talk was going to be. And so approximately uh, an hour ago, I found out I was on tonight. And so I rewrote one of my talks. And uh, I haven't retitled it, but... It's, it's going to be good enough. <laughs> okay, I'll stay there. Anyway, you can see the Dilbert cartoon here. Uh, I, I thought this was particularly good. Uh, the pointy-haired boss and his uh, uh, hoax. And in the era of misinformation, it, this is a wonderful cartoon. <laughs> anyway, uh, eclipses of the sun. Uh, these are the ones that I've seen over the, the years. Uh, it, they don't actually account for the the latest eclipse that I saw which was on the northwest corner of Australia and also the one that I saw in 2017 in the US I have uh, been putting off editing and fixing up this particular draw diagram but um, all of the photographs on this are my photographs and in the places where the photographs look particularly awful Yep, that's that's what the eclipse was. It was particularly awful. We had clouds, oh, terrible things. Well, the eclipse in 2017 was uh, brilliant. Right? How, how many of you at, that are at this talk tonight actually have seen it? And I'll have somebody that's actually there give me a, a, a count, a head count. Uh, I was there. Uh huh. On the center line in in Oregon. Cool. Okay, I'm I'm not uh, getting any feedback, so that's yeah, all right. One online, one online, uh, besides myself. So you got two people here that were there. It, it was it was an extraordinary eclipse. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, we were in Idaho, and it was totally clear. This is a wonderful thing. Ah, I see a hand waving in the distance. Richard Michel. Good, good, excellent. So there are a few people that have seen them, but for those that haven't had the opportunity. Um, I've tried to come up with a, a metaphor that says what the difference between looking at eclipse photographs and 
looking at the real thing and it's like reading about somebody falling in love and actually being there and and being on the hot seat uh in the experience it it's uh, a, a complete world of difference now there are some people that are totally deaf to the uh, beauty but um anybody that's an amateur astronomer i think will fall in love with it and it'll be to the detriment of your uh, retirement savings plans so anyway onwards and upwards well why do eclipses happen in the first place? And why don't we have them all the time? Well, these are the common questions that people ask. And well, the reason why we don't always get an eclipse is our moon has got about a five degree inclined orbit. And so when the moon passes between us and the sun, it very seldom is in a position where it actually casts a shadow on our planet. Now, you'll notice that the moon and the earth are not at the same geometric uh, size. So this is a, a cartoon to sort of explain things, but uh, unless the moon is absolutely on axis with the sun, uh, we don't get an eclipse. And so when the moon does hit this spot, uh, there's a good chance that we'll get an eclipse, but we have two different varieties of eclipse that we can actually get. Uh, if the moon is closer than a certain distance, the moon's diameter will be larger than the sun's apparent diameter, and we'll get a total eclipse. If the moon is farther away from the Earth, like at apogee, we will get an annular eclipse. And so we'll, the, the moon will not completely cover the sun, even when it's absolutely centered on the sun. And so we, we don't see a total eclipse. We see an annular one. And in fact, on October 14th, there is an annular eclipse that goes across the United States from Oregon through, um, I think it comes down through Belize and as it heads to, towards South America. Anyway, uh, annular eclipses are interesting, but they're not the incredible thing that a total solar eclipse is. The total solar eclipse, you get to take the, uh, the solar filter off and all of a sudden you get to see the stuff that is hidden from view for, uh, that you've never seen at any point in your life. And that is an incredible opportunity. It is really, really cool. So uh, when we talk about the shadows that are being projected by an eclipse, the umbra is the dark central part of the shadow. And the penumbra is the part that's not totally covered by the sun or by the moon. Uh, so if you're seeing a partial eclipse, you're in the place where the penumbra is. If you're underneath the total solar eclipse, you're in the umbra. Uh, and pretty cool stuff. Uh, and they, they say that, uh, why is an eclipse like real estate? Well, the three rules of it, real estate, if you haven't heard them before, it's location, location, location. If you're not on the center line, you don't get the total solar eclipse. And so the best place to see it, well, you've got to dig out the maps and figure out where you're going to actually have the opportunity to see the eclipse and you're going to have to travel to it. The next thing that's most important, and I think all amateur astronomers understand the, uh, the metaphor, uh, obscuration is inversely proportional to observation. And so we want to get to a place where the weather is also good it, you can be right on the center line but if if it's 100 percent cloudy uh it's bad news and we have things like that happening in the upcoming 2024 eclipse on april 8th it turns out eastern canada the uh possibilities of cloud are much much higher than they are say in texas or in mexico so if if you want to guarantee that you're going to see it go to Mazatlan, maybe go to texas uh, the other places are iffy. And uh, when you're a hardened eclipse chaser, well, if you're going for the eclipse, you don't want to go for the next best place. You want to see it. And you want to ensure that you're not going to miss it because of the weather. And so the eclipse chasers, they're very, very, very sensitive to this. And uh, they, they head to the right place. Now, here's some old slides. Uh, if you're not 
on the center line, like the people in Edmonton, Calgary, or Coots, Alberta, for the 2017 eclipse, all you're going to see is a partial eclipse. Uh, only if you're on the center line are you going to get the magic of a total solar eclipse. And so that's why you want to be on that track. And here is a picture of the 2017 eclipse. There was a track about 102 kilometers wide when it entered the United States and produced a two-minute uh, eclipse. Uh, at maximum, it was 155 kilometers wide, and it produced two minutes and 40 seconds worth of an eclipse. So you wanted to be somewhere on that. Now, the, the next issue uh, is, well, how the heck do you find these things out? Well, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Xavier Juber, and he creates interactive uh, eclipse maps. And all you have to do is look up Xavier Juber on your uh, search engine and type in Eclipse as well. And it will direct you to his website. And on it, you've got a, a Google Earth map and you'll see where the eclipse is. And then you can zoom into any place you want to on that map and find out interesting things like uh, this is a spot we dropped uh, into Idaho for the 2017 eclipse. Well, if you click anywhere on the map, you get this little pop-up and it shows you all of the parameters that are important to you that are about the eclipse that you're uh, thinking of going and seeing. And you zoom, I'm just zoomed in on this. And it tells you the latitude and longitude of where you're at. And it tells you, well, you're going to get to see about two minutes and 18 seconds worth of total solar eclipse here. And it tells you when the start of the partial phase is, the start of totality, maximum eclipse, end of totality, and then end of the partial phases of the eclipse. So you, you get all of this information and it actually tells you the altitude, azimuth, and uh, other important details about the eclipse. So this is a free uh, site on the internet I highly recommend it. It's a really good place to, you know, do your research and figure out what, where is a good place to be. And you can see that I've had this set up right on Rexburg, Idaho, and we were about 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers due west of Rexburg when we saw the eclipse. And uh, note, the time is in universal time. And for us in mountain daylight time, it's minus six hours. For you in Vancouver, it would be uh, minus seven hours. And so that would tell you when totality starts. And also the red circle shows you where the duration of totality is hidden on this thing. And the other important details. Uh, the next thing that you want to go to and check out is Jay Anderson's site. And Jay Anderson is a, a great Canadian weatherman. He's worldwide renowned for his eclipse forecasting and what he does is you can click you can search him up and his uh, site is eclipsophile.com but if you type in jay anderson and eclipse you will actually find him it's very very easy and he come he comes up with uh, a full analysis of what the weather is going to be like along the profile of the eclipse path and here is a typical profile for that 2017 eclipse. And you can see the blue line is what the uh, 130 weather is like. The red line is for 10.30 in the morning, which is much closer to when the eclipse occurred. Now, this map goes all the way across the United States. And so 10.30 in the morning is when you would have seen totality on the Western side of the United States. And one o'clock, is when you would have seen totality on the other side of the continent. So you can see that the, the conditions do moderate from west to east as the afternoon progresses. And here you, you can zoom in on these eclipse maps and you can see, okay, if I was on this, there you can see my mouse is hovering over Idaho Falls and the little star that appeared uh, is exactly where we were observing the eclipse. And so we, you can plan your, your route. You, you can see that if you're sitting at Idaho Falls, 
and the weather goes to hell on you, which, you know, you never know what the weather is going to be like. It's always important if you're going to go see an eclipse, get there a day or two ahead of time. And that gives you an opportunity to uh, assess what the weather's like. And then if you say, this is dodgy, it, it looks like a weather front might be coming in. If, if you have checked it out, you can figure out that, well, if I need to, I can go to uh, the other side of the path over here on in Oregon, where the, I know that the weather is going to be better. And it's about a five hour drive. So uh, you load everybody and the equipment in the car and you take off if you know that it's going to be cloudy. Um, or uh, you can actually take off and go through the mountains to uh, Jackson Hole and then into uh, Wyoming and uh, possibly see it there. So, you, you know, you at, at the time you have to judge what the weather forecast is going to be like. And then uh, you can look at your escape routes on these maps. Because it's a Google Earth map, you've got all the data you need in front of you to see where the major highways are, to tell if you can actually make an escape from a, a place where the weather is going to go to heck on you. Um, and then when you finally decide where you're going, take documentation with you. Make Get the eclipse maps printed out, road maps, and then print out the timing so that you know. I took the little timing that you can see here and I printed it out for the last eclipse I was at, which was in Australia. And I stuck it up with painter's tape on the uh, the outside wall of our building that we were camped in. And uh, that was the gospel that we had to obey. We needed, we knew exactly when we had to be outside, when we had to to uh, set our watches and check uh, for the first contact, which is kind of fun to see, and then for the uh, other phases of the eclipse. The things that you need to bring, well, you need to bring a flashlight. It turns out that during totality, it can get dark enough that you can't read your camera settings, or if you drop something on the ground, you can't easily find it. So, um, and the other thing is bring a camera. Maybe uh, just do video. If you've never seen an eclipse before, you know, people want to have a record. I, it's nice to have a record of what happened during an eclipse. So set up a camera on a tripod. Uh, don't don't worry about being uh, out there trying to take the best photographs. There are a lot of people out there that will take the best photographs, and you can always copy of them off the Internet. But it's nice to have a, your own shots or your own video of the, the eclipse as it comes across the place that you're staying at. So this is a good thing to do. The accessories that you need, well, eclipse shades, you know, the, the little wraparound eclipse goggles that everybody has at eclipses. You can buy those. If you go on a, uh, a trips that is presented by uh, a company for an eclipse, like one of the, uh, the, the various ones, there's Astro Trails, there's uh, all, all serious uh, uh, adventures, there's TEI tours, there's all kinds of companies that will set up an eclipse trip. But if, if you're going to drive to something, well, you don't really need somebody to uh, show you how to get there. If you're flying to Australia, well, that's a different thing. You, you know, booking hotels, making sure you've got the flights booked, all the other nitty gritty details, it may be worth your while to pay somebody thousands of dollars so that you get on the right place at the right time. And they're going to be really interested in making sure you get to see the eclipse. So they they usually have a, a plan as to what to do if things go to hell. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. But if you're going by yourself, you can check out online and you can find places that will sell the eclipse glasses. And you can pick up a package of uh, 10 or 50 or 100 of them. And I always pick up a bunch of, I've got a bunch of Eclipse glasses in my uh, uh, my filing cabinet. And I always bring spares to an event because I hand them out to friends that I meet on the way. Or if, if you meet people in hotel staff, things like that. If you've got some spare glasses and you want to give a tip to the, the people that are treating you well at your hotel or your the restaurant, you can actually give them some Eclipse classes so that they have something to help them 
see and enjoy the eclipse. Other things that you might want to take along, well, binoculars are a really good thing. Binoculars are absolutely perfect because the extent of the corona around the sun is about between uh, two and three degrees. And most binoculars, that's just perfect. They, they can see that big a chunk of uh, the sky. And you can then have, have a really good view of the chromosphere, of the uh, uh, prominences that are leaping off the sun, stuff like that. Uh, so I, I highly recommend binoculars. Uh, buy a set of filters for your binoculars. You, you might need a pair or one big one, but uh, you, you, you can make the filters as well. You don't need to buy them. Uh, everybody's got a, everybody knows somebody that owns a 3D printer. So you can get a, a quick job of printing 3D cells for making your own filters. And you can buy some solar eclipse film from one of the manufacturers for your club and then cut it up so that you can make 10 pairs of binocular filters. So it, it's easy to do it. Uh, and you do not need great big binoculars. I've seen people with great big 100 millimeter binoculars at an eclipse. That might be kind of fun, uh, but you don't really need them. Uh, eight by 42 is probably pretty good. If you've got big binoculars and you want to take them to an eclipse, you probably enjoy it. It would probably be great. Uh, a good friend of mine brought a pair of uh, 80 by 40 binoculars. They were 40 power. Uh, they were Zeiss binoculars. And they had a spectacular view of the uh, eclipse that we saw in uh, Idaho. You can, uh, and if you've got a small pair of binoculars, wear them around your neck, so you know when where they are when it gets dark. Um, I've instituted a, a a thing with my family, and what it is is that each person has their own binoculars. You don't share binoculars during an eclipse because you don't know where the other people are because it can get that dark. Uh, this present one that I saw, it didn't get that dark. You could always see the things that were around you, but uh, on the 2024 eclipse on April 8th, it's going to get really dark. And so if you've got the binoculars around your neck during totality, you know where they are. You can sit back and uh, look at the sun and see the wonderful things that are there. You can also use a small scope. You, you really don't need a great big telescope. The sun is a fairly large object in the sky. So a small, uh, you know, 20 by 60 scope would probably be great. Uh, but you do need a solar filter for the, that little scope as well. And here's some shots. Here's the people with eclipse shades. The anorexic little kid over there is one of my sons. He's no longer anorexic. And he's looking at the eclipse that we saw in 1998 in Aruba. And in the background behind him, you can see a telescope pointed up at the eclipse. And I was doing eyepiece projection on a, a piece of paper so that you could see the partial phases without resorting to eclipse shades. And in the right-hand pane, you can see a woman at the eclipse in China looking through her shades at the partially eclipsed sun as it's heading for the clouds that are going to kill it in, in about 10 minutes time. This was very sad. Other accessories, well, oops, my slides are running away on me. Um, no, I think that was there. Uh, so here's some shots. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have a tripod to mount your binoculars on. That way you can point it at the sun and you don't have to worry about fishing around hunting for the sun in the sky. Uh, here's a couple gents uh, suffering on the, the beach in Aruba when we saw the eclipse in 1998. And they have identical 20 or uh, 10 by 70 Fujinon binoculars with identical 70 millimeter diameter glass solar filters. This was great. Uh, and, and a small scope, well, there's a friend of mine and he brought a, a light cha lightweight chair. Uh, it's a nice touch. If you're out there somewhere you know, uh, in on a highway or a back road or parking lot, it's kind of nice to have something to sit down in and uh, relax while you're enjoying the eclipse. So cart a, cart a chair along. If you've got uh, you know, a car with you, or if you're flying, you can pick up some of these lightweight tripod stools or uh, other 
little chairs that you can find at uh, the camping goods stores. Here's a telescope I took to Turkey. It's a 90 millimeter Takahashi. Uh, I was actually using this with a Mead flip mirror with my camera and uh, it was wonderful. I had a 24 pan optic with this thing and it was in par focal with the camera. So all I had to do is flip the mirror and uh, look through the eyepiece and flip it back, take a photograph through the camera, flip it back to my eye and continue watching the eclipse. It was it was absolutely great. And the, the view through the, uh, the Sky 90 was fabulous of the eclipse. This is another setup I've got. This is a lighter weight setup and it uses a little equatorial mount called the Takahashi Teagle. Everybody's got uh, the uh, the new ones from uh, Sky Instruments with the uh, the little uh, trackers and they're great. You can stick a camera on them. The nice part is you can point set up things pointed at the sun and it means that you can wander around, come back and the sun's still in the telescope or in the camera. And uh, so this was the setup I had used in Australia. When you're at an eclipse, there's important things to look for. And the first is first contact. That's when the sun just takes a little bite out of the moon, you, or the moon takes a little bite out of the sun. And uh, that's predicted for your sight. So you can use it to set your watch if you want. Um, the C2 is contact two is the diamond ring and then start of totality. And at this point, you see prominences, you see the chromosphere, the corona, and then C3 is the second contact, and that's when the sun first peeks out from behind the moon, and that's the second diamond ring. And it also ushers in the end of totality. And then fourth contact is when the, the last bit of the moon slides off the sun. So there's your diamond ring. So here's a picture of first contact, and you can see that there's just the tiniest little bite out of the moon, or, or the moon is making out of the sun. And this is, uh, uh, it's always a, a challenge to figure out where it's going to come in at, but it's usually in the place that where this, the, uh, the sun is preceding. And so the moon is coming up from the morning sky, and it's, if, if you turn your drive off, you'll see what direction the sun is moving. And that's the side that the uh, the moon is gonna hit first. And uh, the next thing you can do is play with pinhole cameras. There are all kinds of neat ideas. You, here I, I took my watch band and uh, used it to project the sun in Africa in uh, 2001. And uh, this was on Hikuero Atoll in 2010 in Tahiti area. And you can see the little crescent suns projected through the palm leaves. And uh, it's a really neat thing. It's If you don't have a nice convenient tree that's going to generate this stuff, you can take a colander with strainer or uh, a great cheese grater or anything like that that's got holes in it, uh, or take a piece of paper and punch holes in it and let let it cast shadows on the ground and you will uh, you'll get all of these neat little crescent suns. Uh, another thing that you can watch for is Bailey's beads. This is uh, from uh, shots taken on in Indonesia in 2016, and you can see the the, the progression of the Bailey's beads uh, from ingress and egress, and uh, you can see that we were well off center. If you you uh, if you're at the center line, the the moon goes through. The center of the sun and uh, but if you're off center it will uh, be off center as you can see in this particular diagram the next thing to look at is the the diamond ring the diamond ring is the, the sun is still too bright for your eyes but it's a really good thing for photographs and a typical uh i shoot about oh somewhere in the order of about eight thousand of a second with my uh, camera when I'm shooting this stuff. And then once the uh, the diamond ring is gone, then all of a sudden you can see the chromosphere. And here you can see a small slice of it. Uh, you get this just for the first 10 seconds or 20 seconds of a, a, a long total solar eclipse. 
on the short total solar eclipse that I saw just recently, because it was so short and the moon and the sun were at such close diameters, we actually got to see the chromosphere for almost the whole of totality. It was really quite neat, uh, really fun. And then, the, of course, you're going to see prominences as you're going along. The chromosphere uh, has the activity of the prominences leaping out of it. And so you can see these things stretching off into space. It's it's actually quite quite beautiful. And then totality. And here you can see the, the sun is just completely over uh, blowing out my field of view. This one, I believe... Uh, was in 20, 2006, and I was using an effective focal length of about 1,200 millimeters. And it turns out 1,200 millimeters is too much for the, uh, the full totality because it, it uh, escapes the frame of view. Uh, I've since learned that 400 millimeters, 500 millimeters is probably better if you want to get all of totality. Uh, 1,000 millimeters is really good, or 1,500 millimeters is really good if you want to catch the inner phenomena going on around the sun, like the Bailey's beads, the chromosphere, the prominences, things like that, and the brushes of the corona up close to the sun. The, the brushes of the corona are just gorgeous. There's something about them that you cannot quite get in a photograph. They're absolutely spectacular visually and uh, it's something really neat to see another thing that you can watch for while it, the eclipse is going on if you take the binoculars away from your face if you've got a low eclipse you can see the conical shadow of the moon projected on, across the earth's sky and here you can see one edge of the cone the cone is on the left hand side of the screen and the other is almost horizontal on the right hand side of the screen. So this is the shadow of the moon darkening our atmosphere as we're looking at it. And this was a, uh, I think a 10 millimeter wide angle uh, shot through a uh, two thirds frame camera handheld during totality. This is an, uh, another shot showing that <clears throat> same thing, but from about 35,000 feet in a uh, an eclipse uh, jet. We, uh, we got to go up for the uh, eclipse in 2015 over the Faroe Islands in a uh, uh, passenger jet. And it was beautiful to see the eclipse from altitude, but it turns out it was just awful to try to photograph it. So uh, my preference is being on the ground, but uh, this, this was fun. Uh, being up in a plane at 27 or at 35, 37,000 feet, it was really cool. You but when you're on a, an eclipse flight, you buy the whole row of seats from one side of the plane to the other side of the plane. So you've got all six seats. And what you do is you can pull off the seat cushions. You know, they, they tell you in the uh, presentation when you're getting on a plane that in case of an emergency, you can pull off the cushions and find the uh, uh, life vests underneath them. Well, we pulled off the cushions so that it would give us an extra three inches of height so that we could get closer to the windows of the plane. Um, my wife and I both enjoyed having a, a, a window to ourselves to shoot our camera gear out of. And uh, it was it was quite a it was quite a blast. The, the plane was a real party. Uh, and uh, there was champagne popping corks and stuff happening immediately after this eclipse. It was absolutely spectacular. Uh, this is not a video clip because my videos um, quit working on this, but this is my wife in 2016. She's got a camera with a filter on it and she's taking photographs of the sun uh, just on a, a fixed tripod. She does not have uh, a star adventurer tracking the sun, but uh, the, the partial phases, you've, you've got lots of time to recenter the sun and take your photographs as the eclipse is going on. Uh, another thing to look for when you're at an eclipse is the shape of the corona. Sometimes the corona is really round and symmetrical as it was in 2001 and 2012, but other times 
the corona has uh, a real extent laterally on east and left west side of the sun as it did in 2006 uh, 2008 and 2017 was uh, dramatic as well it it was uh, very similar to 2008 with one long spire sticking off in one direction and two uh, sticking up above the sun for the 2017 eclipse. Whoops. Let's see if I can go back to that one. Yeah, this is a, a shot of uh, the field as we were set up in Lakeland, uh, Australia for the uh, 2012 eclipse. And so we had a, a probably about 15, 20 people that parked their cars and stopped at the side of the road. To, you know, just everybody pulled off. It was a nice looking little field. Everybody plunked down their equipment, got their cameras and their video and uh, telescope set up. And uh, Alan Dyer is in this shot somewhere. Uh, I think he's, there's a, a man kneeling down on the ground. Right above him, you can see Alan Dyer uh, and his black astrophysics uh, traveler refractor in the background. But this was great. They, there was no clouds to worry about. And uh, we had just a, a great experience. Uh, yet another thing to look for when you're at a, a total solar eclipse. Well, it's really neat. You've got this circularly symmetric shadow that's on top of you if you're on the center line. If you're off center, well, you'll get uh, one side being brighter than the other. But if you're exactly on the center, you, you're in the middle of a, do a black donut of uh, uh, the sun's shadow. And so what you get is the, you get those sunrise colors in the sky because way off in the distance, the sun is illuminating the earth. You know, the, the, for this particular eclipse, uh, it was probably about 60, 70 kilometers away from us that, uh, no, maybe closer to 100 kilometers that the sun was actually shining on the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, but uh, it wasn't on us. And But because of that, you get wonderful sunrise, sunset kind of colors in the sky. It was really, really cool. And that, the next thing that you can do too is on the day after a, a solar eclipse, you get the, the day old new moon and uh, it's some order of, you know, a little bit more than 24 hours old. Uh, so uh, it's always fun to, to make sure you get out and uh, try to get a shot of it. Uh, this is a shot from uh, Indonesia in 2016. Uh, beautiful sunset with, sunset with a, a corpuscular rays and uh, a nice little moon in there. Well, what do you need? Well, you need an ephemeris with contact one through four times for the location you've chosen. It might be good to have uh, these for the your plan B and plan C. You know, you're, if you've got places that you might have to run to, it'd be nice to have those things on record as well. You need eclipse shades, filters or welder's glass, um, a filter for your camera and binoculars or telescope. You do not need the solar filters at totality, not at all. You want to take them off because you're going to get the the show of a lifetime at totality. Um, and then uh, uh, the binoculars or a low power scope with a filter, they're great. Camera gear so that you can have, have a, a photograph that you can say is your own that you took during the eclipse. But if you're seeing your first eclipse, don't get hung up on taking pictures. Sometimes the, you leave it in autofocus and your camera all of a sudden is hunting for focus. Don't try to fix it, just forget the camera. Uh, if anything goes wrong, forget the camera because the eclipse is gonna go on without you. And you'd hate to be spending your time uh, looking at your camera and all of a sudden discovering that the eclipse is over. Um, so that's a really important thing. And if you're going to use camera gear, well, you have to have tripods for it. I did take the shot of the uh, the uh, moon's shadow with a uh, a handheld camera, but I I ran out of tri tripods at the time, so uh, I didn't have a choice. And if you're going to be somewhere and there's possibility of bad weather, transportation is critical. 
if you've got mobility, you can always run for it. And most people that run for it get to see the eclipse. Most people that sit back and say, well, maybe it'll get better, don't get the eclipse. Other nice things to take, well, if you, it's kind of fun having a, a GPS so you know exactly where you are. Mind you, Google Maps can probably tell you that. A video recorder so that you can record uh, the event, events around you. You don't even need to point it at the sun, but uh, for the last eclipse that I was at, I actually took my cell phone, put it on a camera, a little cell phone camera stand, and pointed it up so that I could see the sun and some of us uh, in the, the image, and then just started it uh, three minute, two minutes before the eclipse, and then walked back to my telescope and forgot about it. Uh, you can also just point a camera in the area that you are and take images, you know, a video of people and the circumstance. It's amazing afterwards to watch these videos because you can see uh, it's quite bright two minutes before the eclipse. And then all of a sudden it gets darker and darker. And then all of a sudden it it just catastrophically just bang. It's dark and you're at totality. Uh, and it's it's always such an amazing thing to uh, to see that. Another thing is important is fresh batteries for your camera. I, I always put fresh batteries the night beforehand. And that way I don't have to think about it in the morning because usually I, I don't sleep well during the night before an eclipse. And so you're a bit of a bit of a scrambled brains the, the, the day of the eclipse. So if you've done it the night beforehand, well, your camera's got fresh batteries. Uh, and then make sure you've got a flashlight. So if you do, if you drop something, you might need to find it, um, but hopefully not. And then the, the, once again, to summarize the, the games that you can play, you can look for that first contact, estimate, and see if you can be the first to spot it. This is good sport. Uh, another thing is to look for shadow bands. And what's really neat is during a sol total solar eclipse, uh, as you get close to totality, but just before it, the sun uh, is still peeking off the edge of the moon and it becomes very much like a narrow slit. And all of a sudden you can get these weird interference effects with the atmosphere between you and the sun uh, and the, the inhomogeneities in that atmosphere can cause these uh, stripes and stuff to wiggle and shimmer on the ground like uh, the stuff that you see at the bottom of the swimming pool. And so, uh, but much, these things happen much faster than the, the swimming pool shadows. Yeah. So they're, they're kind of neat. I've only seen them a couple times in all of the eclipses that I've seen. Uh, you can also look at the pinhole camera projections of the sun's crescent on the ground through the leaves on trees or through that uh, strainer colander that you've brought with you or the cheese grater. When we were in the U.S. in 2017, of course, we had to try to make America great again. Sorry, that was bad. Um, and you can also look for the planets or brighter stars in the sky. With this 59-second or 57-second of eclipse that we had this year, it was just too too short. Uh, the you know you don't have much time. Just before totality, you can look up and you can always find Venus because Venus is bright now. But the uh, the other planets can be uh, a bit of a challenge, and brighter stars, yeah, they're a ch they're a challenge. But if you're in the uh, the area of Mazatlan or in Texas for the eclipse on April eighth next year, it's a long enough eclipse, four minutes and twenty four seconds, that you probably would be able to see some of the brighter stars in the sky. It's uh, it's really cool to see if you can actually find them when you've got four minute eclipse. You've got lots of time to to look around and see other things that are in the sky. A one minute eclipse, no, you don't have a lot of time. If it's your first eclipse, just enjoy it. Use binoculars and stuff like that. Don't worry about photography, but if you have to have to get your own photo, uh, and I'm terrible for that because I've never not photographed an eclipse, um, I simply set up a video camera in which you start two minutes before C2 and shut it off after, when you remember it after the uh, totality is over. And you can take wide field camera shots. They're, they're great. 
Uh, they show it people, they show the configuration and things that were going on. Uh, they're kind of fun. And optics bring binoculars. And I, I've always promised myself, uh, since I'm a diehard photographer, I give myself the middle one third of the eclipse and I sit there with the binoculars and I enjoy it. And then when my 30 seconds or minute is over, I put the binoculars down and I continue taking photographs. Um, and also look for those crimson prominences just after C2 and just before C3, or if you're in a really short eclipse, and man, they're all over uh, sticking out from the, uh, the side of the eclipse that we saw in, in Australia just recently. That was, that was great. And soak up that 360 sunset, sunrise, sunset. It's, it's incredible. And if you're really ambitious, you can get a diffraction grating and photograph the corona flash spectrum, which you can actually see the lines of helium, which are yellow. And uh, were the, they were the way that helium was actually initially discovered was in the flash spectrum of uh, the sun. And uh, so that, that's really, really quite cool. Well, no, eclipses that are going to be in North America from 2001 to 2050. Well, you can these are total and annular eclipses here. And uh, the 2017, I'm pointing to that one right now. That one's over. Uh, the 2014, well, that's an annular eclipse. So that one doesn't count as a total. 2024, that's a total solar eclipse. And the next one is 2044. So uh, you've got uh, one year for the, the eclipse in 24 and 21 years for the eclipse in 2044, which covers Ed, Edmonton area and much of Alberta. You can, you know, it's a short drive from BC to Alberta to be able to catch some of this. And you could even catch it in the mountains uh, between Alberta and BC. It would, uh, it'll be better somewhere out in uh, the prairies of, of Alberta. But I'm, that's a long time off, and I'm not going to count on being able to see that one. You can see my gray hair, and uh, yeah, it, it, it would put me at about 95 years old if somebody might wheel me out and, so that I can see it. Uh, so the next eclipse as well, there, we just came from the hybrid, but the, the April 8th in North America next year, but the year after that, there's one on August 12th, and it goes from Greenland through Iceland to Spain. And I think of all of those places, uh, Iceland sounds tempting, but the uh, so I'm going to review, review the uh, weather prospects before I buy my airlines tickets. It might just be Spain that I go to. Uh, in 2027, there is uh, an, another incredible event. The eclipse goes across Egypt and North Africa, and it will go across Luxor, Egypt. So if you want to see the pyramids and, and you want that one chance in your life, well, this is a six and a half minute eclipse, I think, at Luxor. And so uh, there are eclipse companies all over the place that are setting up their tours through uh, Egypt. And Egypt is a place, I'm not sure that I'm brave enough just to go to take a plane trip to Egypt and hire a car and drive around. Uh, I think I would be uh, much more comfortable uh, traveling with a group and having guides that knew what was going on and knew where you should go and should not go. So that would that would be really quite interesting. And also in 2028, there's one more chance to go to Australia or South New Zealand to see a, a total solar eclipse. And this is in uh, the Australia, New Zealand's winter. So the south end of New Zealand actually will be cold. There will be snow on the ground. Uh, make no doubt about that. In Australia, well, the north end of Australia will be hot and tropical. It's always hot and tropical. But as it goes through Sydney, Australia, it might be a bit more winterish, and I don't know quite what the weather prospects are like, but uh, I, I wouldn't mind being up in the, the tropical north of Australia at the time. That would be kind of fun. Um, and also 2030, well, November 25th, South Africa 
and Australia. And this is uh, getting close to uh, summertime in both places. So it's going to be hot both in Australia and South Africa. But uh, yeah, and another nice eclipse. So that sort of rounds out uh, the, this decade that we're sitting in. Uh, if you want more of these things, you can go to a thing called uh, Time and Date. They've got uh, a presentation of the, the eclipses over the next 10 years. And you can see where they skim across the, the planet Earth. And you can see the uh, one that skims across South Africa, number five, and it skims across a big patch of Australia. It looks like it gets Adelaide and uh, might actually get sunset uh, at uh, Cairns, Australia. So neat stuff, really neat stuff. And uh, this is our vacation planet. <laughs> A friend of mine gave me this uh, as a, a gift. And this is all the eclipses around the world from 2011 to 2060. And uh, it's a nice thing to sit on the wall and walk up to it and think about, well, where's that one going? And where's this one? And uh, this one shows all of the total and of the annular eclipses. I think the to annulars are in pink and the totals are in yellow. So uh, good fun. And this is a map that you can buy from a, a company called eclipsemaps.com. Uh, it's curated by Michael Zeller of Santa Fe and, it, and also New Mexico, USA. So um, really, really cool. Uh, there's a Canadian who calls himself uh, David Makepeace, but his site is eclipseguy.com. And he's got all kinds of videos and uh, he's uh, still hooked on the shadow. Uh, and he's got all kinds of neat videos on different eclipses and stuff like that. He, he's uh, a really interesting guy. We met him in Australia a number of years ago. Really, really cool stuff. So that ends my eclipse thing. Uh, but I thought I would add a few more photographs. This is uh, from a, a small plane at 27,000 feet over Cambridge Bay in uh, 20, 2008. And uh, it, it's a, just a nice, spectacular image, uh, just showing the, the vivaciousness of a, an eclipse. Um, this is where my telescope was almost exactly a month ago, uh, actually three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. Uh, this is in a, in a resort in Exmouth, Australia. And I was doing uh, astrophotography the night before the solar eclipse. I would have stayed up all night taking pictures, but I, I really wanted to get some sleep before the eclipse because I'm notoriously uh, nervous or high strung and I can't sleep before eclipses. It's just awful, but you need to try. So this is one of my shots of this last eclipse. And you can see the prominences are just spectacular. You've got all kinds of wonderful stuff happening on the sun here. And there's a big arch prominence just at 12 o'clock. There's a disconnected prominence hanging up in space at about one o'clock. Uh, and then this other nice one at 10 o'clock on the sun, it was just gorgeous. This was totality and uh, beautiful, almost symmetrical uh, distribution from the sun. Really, really lovely. And then finally, the final diamond ring heralding the, the end of the solar eclipse. It was uh, absolutely wonderful. And I thought I would give you one more thing, just another excuse why you might want to go to the Southern Hemisphere. All of these photographs are at exactly the same image scale. There's M13, M22 in the Milky Way, and Omega Centauri. And Omega Centauri, you can see that it absolutely dwarfs M13. Uh, these were all taken with exactly the same telescope. Uh, the M13 one was actually taken during summer twilight uh, from my backyard in Edmonton area. But the other ones were taken from Cobau and from uh, uh, Exmouth, Australia. So anyway, that ends my talk. 
And if I can just find my uh, screen sharing stuff, I will stop sharing. So anyway, uh, that I'm uh, that ends my my talk. And uh, are there any questions? Back in 2017, I took a film crew with uh, from Eastland TV and a whole bunch of eclipsomaniacs from my center down to uh, Monmouth, Oregon. We were right on the on the center line there, and we had that 360 aurora. And yeah, we got some good shots from that. Mm. Cool, cool. <coughs> I, I would also recommend that people not plan to leave in a hurry afterwards because everybody starts to leave simultaneously in this instantaneous gridlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were, you were in Oregon? Yeah. So yeah, Oregon uh, got, it got a huge traffic jam. And oh, I was in Idaho at the time. And we... Uh, We'd actually driven up to the eclipse on the back roads, and so we just naturally went on the back roads back to uh, Idaho Falls, and we could see the people on the freeways, and they were not moving. The freeways were just jammed, and uh, everybody had decided that when the eclipse was over, they were going to go home, uh, and uh, it was just, you know, they sat in, in that traffic jam for hours and hours. We were on yeah, the back we roads. We got home right away. <laughs> Yeah, so you should uh, definitely take that in, into account when you're going to one of these things. We we were not they weren't expecting any astronomers to show up at this park in uh, in my mouth. Mm -hmm. We were quite popular. We had our solar scopes and everything. And, uh, oh, nice. Yeah, there's people from all over the world there. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I think they a lot of people tended to underestimate what it was going to be like. And uh, there was a really good showing of people for this eclipse in 2017. Yeah, here on the Sunshine Coast, we had people watching the partial. We had something like 1,200 people show up at our telescopes down at Davis Bay. It uh, it attracted a lot of people. I'm I'm wondering whether we're going to have a, a good turnout for the 14th of October when we have the partial annual mm -hmm. uh, up here. So yeah, yeah. It's it's too bad that uh, some of those people didn't, uh, you know, go a little farther south and see the, the real thing. It's it's amazing, you know, it the the difference between the partial and the total. It's just there's you know, there's no comparison, honestly. Yeah. If, if people out there need to be convinced, let them convince you. It's it's an experience. It's, it's so incredible. Um, somebody uh, just asked a question: Where am I going to be in uh, April eighth? And We've actually already rented a uh, cabins at a campsite in uh, Texas. Uh, we're about 100 kilometers west of El Paso, or not uh, El Paso. I've forgotten what the name of the town, the major community we're going to, but uh, we're going to be on the center line uh, at a, uh, a resort in cabins that I think they're about $100 a night, 120 a night. So. We've got a three night rental. That's cheap. Uh, usually, what happens during eclipses is uh, everybody along the center line jumps their rates to about three times what they were before. <laughs> so, the the um, the moral of the story is get your stuff before the prices go up. Yeah, everybody, uh, all the farmers around there were renting their fields. Yeah, yeah. There were all kinds of people at the farmers' fields, and they were uh, selling drinks and all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. We were on uh, something called Mina and Butte, which was just west of uh, uh, the one town, uh, Rexburg, uh, Idaho, and it was thirty dollars per car to go up on top of this volcano, uh, this derelict volcano, and but it was a beautiful view from up there. And that you could rent, you could put your camper or your tent in the farmer's field for another uh, so many dollars. I think it was a hundred dollars a night. <laughs> so they just rake the money in hand. Oh there. yeah. But uh, the hotels in uh, Idaho Falls, they, uh, if you wanted a hotel the day before the eclipse, it was fifteen hundred dollars a night. 
<laughs> oh man. Yeah. So there's a lot of profiteering going on. Oh yeah. Any questions from the audience here? Yeah, you go ahead, Dave. Could you explain the geometry? Two of the eclipses shown on your third from the end slide showed the one in northern Canada being a loop around. Oh, yeah. Whereas most of the others are almost a straight line. Uh, let's see. I'll go back to that one that is. Uh, what it is, is that the moon's shadow hits the earth, but the earth is turning at the same time as this shadow is traversing this course on the earth. So this represents the motion of the, the shadow traversing the spherical earth that is rotating during the eclipse. And so like the particular shadow of the 2044 eclipse, uh, it's, a, it's a nice arc. And that shows that the, the shadow hits in one spot. Uh, it usually comes in on the west side and uh, will circle around and exit on the east side of the, the path that it's coming on. What I'm saying is that from two to seven at the top of the screen, this is actually a very short distance, but it, because it's stretched out, it's kind of crazy. And uh, but normally, if you know, if, if a, an eclipse is happening over the midpoint of the Earth, it it forms this sort of S-shaped um, curve. And as you get closer to the poles, depending on the circumstance it gets crazier and crazier. Uh, the eclipses always start on the uh, west-hand side and they move towards the east-hand side is where the, the moon, the shadow will exit. <laughs> anyway, the, this is the 2044 eclipse, which I think is the one that you were talking about. And it starts down here in, uh, over in South, in, Daco in the Dakotas. And wraps itself up around the pole and then comes down over uh, uh, Greenland. And what it is, is it's just that the earth is rotating, but as it's going up, it's also traversing the a spherical earth and it runs off this other side. And uh, it's just a matter of the geometry and the trajectory of the moon. But yeah, the, these eclipse paths are, are really wild. And uh, you know, the closer they are to the pole, the stranger things that they do. And then, as I said, if we go down to time and date, uh, you can see the ones at the top of the screen. They they're just really stretched out. They're they're uh, ridiculously long. And actually, the distance between number two, where I'm marking, and number seven is only thousands of kilometers. It's not. Uh, you know, if we move the same distance uh, from, if we go from five to two, looks like the same distance, but that's literally probably about uh, 8,000, 10,000 kilometers. So, uh, you know, the, the, the distortions of the projected globe are making this uh, an issue. Anyway, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand it back to you, Charles.